Yes, so welcome everybody. At uh, Kerops, we have the habit of starting our session with an icebreaker question, but today uh, there's no icebreaker question, but um, I brought a riddle and I'll, I'll share my screen because the riddle needs a little bit of a backdrop. So while the audience is joining, we, we don't like awkward silences, so we'll go into that riddle immediately. So it's the following. When you go and do some shopping on Amazon, or when you go and, and get healthcare, there's something that is very similar to both of these and something that is very different to both of these. Who has an idea? I'm gonna go last. I wanna hear what everyone else has to say first because I will always have a particular lens on this. A, a tip, it has something to do with the session of today. I would actually say this has nothing to do with the session today, but one has tri uh, price transparency and the other one doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good one. Yeah, one has tri price transparency, a clear uh, list of options. Uh, and uh, I'm guessing you're gonna say Amazon experiments constantly with how they uh, present their uh, catalog of offerings. Lucia? Um, well, I'm going to say a couple things. One is, of course, there's usually peer-reviewed evidence behind what happens in a hospital, and there may or may not be peer-reviewed evidence behind what you buy on Amazon, other than the reviews, which are not really peer-reviewed. They're good, you know, touchstones if you're buying a set of headphones, but maybe not for something else. So that's one. Obviously, privacy rules are dramatically different in both of those environments. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I think the price transparency is a good one, but we're going to have that for another day as our topic, right, Thomas? Uh, absolutely, looking forward to that. So, uh, actually, Richard was actually going in the right direction. So, this what's what's uh, very similar to both is that you're actually being experimented on, and how it's different is that on Amazon, a lot of the experiments are controlled, whereas in healthcare, a lot of the experiments are not controlled, and. Let me unpack that a little bit because it's an important uh, nuance that we need to make here. So when you're visiting Amazon or you're using products like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or, or basically any e-commerce site, at any time you might be subject to hundreds of experiments running, right? Indeed, as Richard has been saying on pricing, images, suggested products, all of these. And they, these experiments are designed and they're set up in a, in a pretty controlled way, right? Now, with clinical research, as Lucia says, that is that is very similar, you know, meticulously designed studies, carefully controlled, but the problem is with clinical practice. And that's why we have the, the asterisk here on, uh, on the slide. And just to unpack that a little bit, the topic of variation in clinical practice has been widely documented. And, and I'll give an example. If I suffer from uh, a myocardial infarction or a or heart attack, when I'm rushed to a hospital and I'm being rushed to hospital A, I could, I could have a 4x higher chance of survival than hospital B in the same city with similarly trained doctors, similar facilities. And the only thing that can explain such a meaningful difference is actually the protocol that is being followed. So in essence, every time that we're being, you know, getting healthcare and that we're being cared for, whether it's in a brick and mortar facility or in a tech enabled services provider, I'm actually being A-B tested upon by the system and no one has designed that experiment, nor asked for my consent to be experimented on. So this just as a topic to introduce the session of today, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Thank you uh, to our panelists, Lucia, Richard, Therese for making time. Everybody has very busy agendas. Thank you also for the uh, more than 300 people who registered today. CareOps is a currently community of over 2,500 people and, and still growing rapidly. The session will be recorded and will be sent to everybody who uh, registered for it. There's some Q&A at the end, but you can already during the session post your questions as they come up because we have Rick, my trusted co-author at CareOps, uh, monitoring the chat and being my co-host. Uh, so please continue throughout the session uh, to let your stream of consciousness go and uh, put your notes, your comments, your suggestions and questions, and we'll try to pick them up as we go into the conversation. So in a minute, I'll ask our panelists to formally introduce themselves, but first a quick recap on why we're here today. Um, what is CareOps? Um, so CareOps is not a business. It's not a for-profit. It is uh, bringing people together around the dialogue to 
uh, built, operate, and continuously improve care processes or care flows, as we call it within CareOps, to ultimately drive outcome improvements for patients and increased care delivery efficiency to drive down the cost of care. Now, care flows can mean a lot of things, ranging from patient intake to even a digital therapeutic is also a care flow, right? And that, that might be some of the topics that we'll be discussing today. The reason why CareOps is important is because the way that we currently build and implement and improve these care flows is, is very much broken. There's a lot of input ranging from evidence-based guidelines uh, to the way that we've been doing things always, uh, and many other inputs are taken. And a lot of time is spent by product teams, by clinical operations teams, by software engineers to map out these care flows and build these care flows into technology that is technology that is patient facing, technology that is care team facing, facing to support the care delivery process. Very often there is um, difficulty in building out these care flows, which means that this process is not very uh, easy to set up and um, ultimately leads to people uh, losing time and losing a lot of uh, effort in, in the process. Uh, very nice example was posted by Rick a while ago where he was talking to a director of product at a very big digital health company. And, and this is a very big company. We cannot name the name, but where a product launch was delayed by 13 months because they um, implied the legal and compliance side of the business too late. So they were um, basically halted in their product launch and that caused a 13 month delay to launch. So this is a very nice example of what could go wrong in this process. So very similar to what DevOps has done for software development, CareOps aims to do for care flow development. Teams who practice the CareOps lifecycle uh, in the right way will get to market faster with their care flows. Uh, they will be able to increase their operational efficiency of care teams and provide higher quality of care to patients while keeping patients safe. And that is the topic of, uh, of today. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen here. And without further ado, asking the people to introduce themselves. Maybe first you, Rick, as my co-host, if you could introduce yourself. Yeah. So hey, everyone. I'm Rick, nurse. I'm a nurse by training. I'm working at AWEL, where we are on our mission to make care flows work harder than care teams. And I'm also the co-author of uh, CareOps. My name is Thomas. I'm CEO and co-founder of AWEL and also co-author at CareOps. And now it's up to the panelists. So we will start with Lucia, if you could introduce yourself and then Therese and Richard, last but not least. Sure. Sure. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lucia Savage. I'm currently head of privacy, regulatory and public policy at Omada Health, which um, is a digital health company founded in 2011. We deliver uh, a suite of cardiometabolic coaching services and physical therapy all through uh, asynchronous care. We operate as a physician healthcare provider, same legal rules as the doctor's office. We're not a direct to consumer company at all, billing insurance with claims. And then I think relevant to this particular problem today, um, I have spent much of my career advising business people in a wide variety of healthcare settings on the right rules for setting up human subjects research, for doing retrospective claims analysis, and sort of handling the data that people generate when they're getting care in an ethical way so that the care, uh, we can analyze if it's safe. Um, and we can also figure out, you know, when we're testing new protocols in an RCT, how that works. And my last comment is, I think, very provocative slide, Thomas, but I think that we would have something to discuss about whether variation and experimentation are the, actually the same thing. And I would posit that they are, in fact, quite different. We do have variation in care. Sometimes it's disadvantageous, and sometimes it's really advantageous. Like you actually might want your provider to change the way they speak so that they're providing culturally appropriate care, depending on who the patient is who walks in the door. Uh, and I'll just tag Therese next. Okay, hi. Thanks, Lucia. That was a really good point. I, I appreciate that. I'm Therese Tatum. I am the Vice President of Clinical Performance and Innovation at Twin Health. Um, my role is really focused on a lot of uh, bringing new services to market, um, focusing, we're, we're a metabolic health company, similar to Omada, 
Uh, we leverage the whole body digital twin technology, which is a lot of wearable sensors. We combine it with a care team, um, physician oversight, um, and uh, help people sort of reverse, improve, and prevent chronic metabolic diseases, particularly diabetes, prediabetes, um, obesity, and uh, kind of the whole the whole gamut. Um, my background is uh, previous to this, I was at One Medical for eight years, leading their strategic operations. My area of focus has been predominantly around bringing new services and innovation or enhancing our current services, doing it in a clinically appropriate way. I'm also a clinician by training. I'm a family nurse practitioner um, and really focus on bringing care team efficiency. That's kind of my, my passion. So that's where I'm focused. So we do a lot of different types of testing. Um, both the traditional kind with research, as well as the the more product focused A/B testing. So this is a great conversation, and really appreciate the invite. And I'll pass it over to you, Richard. Thanks, Therese. Uh, I'm Richard Mathera, managing director at Irrational Labs. I oversee our healthcare practice, and uh, at Irrational Labs, we're an applied behavioral science and product design consultancy. And so we were spun up. We started. Uh, 10 years ago, co-founded by Dan Ariely out of Duke University and sort of spun up the idea that there are a lot of really powerful insights coming out of academia around human behavior and decision-making. You're really studying that decision-making um, and taking those insights from academia, building them into industry. And so we've uh, worked uh, extensively uh, across a variety of industries, uh, both uh, healthcare, uh, large tech, and also financial decision-making and sort of built these behavioral insights into product design. One of the important things about behavioral science is that uh, you've likely heard something about behavioral science, behavioral economics, uh, nudging, something like that. Um, the field generally wouldn't be where it is without uh, experimentation and testing. One of the reasons that behavioral science is so powerful, and maybe even the primary reason, is that uh, it's based on um, a large body of randomized controlled trials. And so um, we at Irrational Labs run randomized controlled trials or, or A-B tests uh, with our partner companies and uh, we also do out-of-product testing. So we do a lot more like agile pre-testing, prototyping, uh, out-of-product quantitative testing as well, and in instances where uh, we can't randomize control uh, test. So uh, personally, um, again, my background is in behavioral science. I'm a behavioral scientist by training. I love the experimentation side of things. And so um, I'm excited to have this conversation with you all today. Great. Thanks all. Thanks to all of you. So one of our main objectives at CareOps is to make things tangible and concrete. So where possible, we'll, we'll stay away from the philosophical discussions today. We know that experimentation ultimately re revolves around ethics, right? Uh, and everybody wants to be ethical. So the conversation really is around uh, how do people get started in, in a pra practical manner? Um, how can they have the right conversations with each other? Where can they draw the line with the right frameworks? So as a start, I think we can all agree that it's, it's impossible to run controlled experiments or randomized clinical trials on every change you make to a process that potentially impacts patients. If you would have to do that, you would, you would basically come to a halt. If, if, is that something that we can agree on, or or do we do we start with this statement first? Um, so I'll just be a little bit. Of the, I I think that's generally right, right. But I would add a caveat, which is you have to understand why we have that principle in the first place, because that's actually the mechanism by which you sort. And so if you go all the way back to the Hippocratic Oath, and everyone has heard this said, first do no harm. The idea here is that the Evaluating of one method versus another method should not, one, cause harm to a person they didn't know they signed up to experience. That's what the consent mechanism is all about. So harm is a really important thing. And secondly, deprive them of care that they thought they were going to get, again, because that could cause harm. And so you, you can't just look at it in the abstract. You have to actually look at it in the why we did it. And I think to me, and this is what I use when I'm working with product people, and I've worked with them for many decades. So uh, things I say today are not specific to Omada. Uh, it's about the why helps you contextualize and the why helps you drive. It's like your litmus test, literally like the litmus paper. 
how does this thing I'm doing measure up to the why, the reason we have this rule in the first place? Thanks for that context, Lucia. So, so as, as a care provider, any care provider out there, whether it's brick and mortar, hybrid, tech-enabled services, um, there are so many metrics you could be optimizing for, from patient engagement metrics to clinical outcomes, everything in between. And um, so which ones would you say uh, to provide, let's say, uh, an initial framework uh, could be clear targets for controlled experiments and which ones uh, fall more into a gray zone, for example? I might take that one. So I, I think it's really important when you're doing testing. I mean, one could say, oh, the clinical piece is the one that you really need to have much more controlled around. And I would agree with that. But I think when you're when you're thinking about optimizing for a company, you want to kind of optimize for all of them, right? You want to optimize for your business outcomes, your clinical outcomes, and your your um, and your member experience or your patient experience. And the best is when they are actually all aligned. So I can think of a good example, which is there was research that came out in the last I think ten or fifteen years around. Uh, fasting labs and whether or not you need to do fasting labs for cholesterol checking in your annual physical. Well, this was an issue that we addressed at One Medical where operationally, it was really difficult to have people come back every, you know, in the morning when they're fasting to try and get their labs done. So here's this new clinical evidence that says, hey, you don't have to do that. We had an operational problem where you have this huge bolus of people coming in in the morning to get their labs they're hangry, they're hungry and they're angry because they they're there, they're starving. Um, they're waiting in line, right? So they have a terrible member experience. There's no clinical evidence that you need to do this anymore. And so it was a great example where you could actually do something that was great for operations. You could change your clinical practice and you could improve the member experience. Those are the areas where you really want to focus your energy, where you can do it all. Now, you can't always do that. But what you can do is, for instance, if you need to change something to drive a business lever, you've got to make sure that you don't, you don't worsen the clinical experience. Like you've got to hold that steady while you drive on exper experiments to improve that. So you've got to maintain, you know, oversight and clinician oversight to make sure that clinical outcomes don't change. So I think that's the important piece. Um, I'll, I'll kind of stop there. I could keep going, but. I, I think that's right. I think you have to sort of look at across a healthcare delivery method, and it could be a traditional clinical setting, and it could be, as you said, Thomas, hybrid or all virtual. Some levers are going to be the same, like how hard is it for the patient to get the appointment? How hard is it for them to pay their share of whatever it is they're supposed to pay? Like these things are sort of persistent across the healthcare system. And maybe those things are things where you can, you know, the issues of harm and uh, d deprivations of care don't really kick in and you can double down on those and straighten those out. And we all know there's what 30% alleged administrative inefficiency in healthcare. Um, so let's see if we can't, uh, you know, really work on that and squeeze that uh, piece of fruit for a little bit. But when you get to the clinical delivery side, you have to be more careful and a little bit more thoughtful. It doesn't mean you have to go slower. It means you have to go more thoughtfully. So uh, DJ Patel, chief data scientist uh, at the White House, when I was in HHS, I think somebody else told him this, but move thoughtfully and fix things as opposed to move quickly and break things is a really great way to think about it in healthcare. And one, one thing I might add is uh, as you're thinking about sort of what of variables or what you actually want to test or experiment on. In behavioral science, we think about the assumptions that we make uh, that connect the outcomes to whatever we're measuring. And typically what we're what we're measuring is maybe not the same as an outcome, right? We might have a clinical outcome, we might have a business, business outcome. And I think one of the things that we try to understand uh, when we're uh, improving uh, any process or or outcome is what is that link? Do we feel really good about the link between the outcome and whatever we're measuring? And it's not always watertight. And there are a couple of examples of when you might see that link actually break down and you solve really well for whatever you're testing, but then you find out that actually it's not linked to the outcome of interest that we're, that we're looking for. You can think of, um, we worked with a large uh, mental health care provider recently, um, and we were working on their sort of onboarding experience to get to see a mental health uh, clinician. 
And one of the things we recommended was adding more screens and more experiences to build a mental model um, and actually build sort of self-efficacy. The hypothesis is that maybe someone's coming into that experience feeling particularly down. Um, and this particular solution, right, creates friction, right, because we're adding to the experience and that onboarding, we know, hey, we're adding friction, people could drop off, um, but it depends what we're measuring in terms of is this good or not, right? It may actually increase short-term drop-off, uh, but in the long-term, does it increase whatever our, our outcome and our key behavior, our key variable of interest is? So does it actually increase the likelihood that someone follows through all the way and, and meets uh, with that mental health care provider? So I think that assumption and that connection uh, to your point, Thomas, to that question uh, between what is being tested and what is the true outcome of interest, I think is a really important one to analyze when we're running experiments. So you, you touched upon something really interesting there, Richard, which is what you could call, you know, what you could call scope of your experiment, right? If you if you take a very narrow scope, you could be experimenting on on the on the on the throughput and, and let's say the conversion rate of your onboarding flow and maybe some people would say Let, let's just maximize the conversion rate and get as many patients in as possible that will be a totally different experiment than than what you just said like you you might want to sacrifice that kind of short term narrow scope outcome but 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 by by better selection of your patients right um, leading them to better outcomes uh, for the for the overall population that that gets care. But then the, the other side of that medal could be that what Lucia uh, said earlier is that maybe maybe at that point in time you are uh, selecting certain populations out of the ability to uh, to to get to get the care that that they might deserve. Right. So um, you, you see how you very very easily get into uh, into challenges there. Any reactions? Well. I was going to address, I think one of the, the key things that is an area where you can experiment clinically, and it's it's not necessarily clinically, but if you take a generally accepted clinical practice, right, really what, you're dry, what, what you can test around is the modality of delivery. And I think that's a lot of what digital technology companies are doing is really testing on, here's a generally accepted practice or protocol for approaching something, even if it's like onboarding, right? Um, there's certain things clinically you want to do in the onboarding process. You want to make sure that they um, understand the program, understand what they're getting into, kind of getting all the key pieces of information. You're getting, you need to get the right clinical history on them to understand what, you know, what their clinical background is. But you can, you can test different ways to actually capture that information. And, and you're not changing anything clinically. You're not changing the quality of care. You may be testing out different modalities and then doing a double check. Hey, did they get the information? Did we get the information we needed from them? And they did they get the information from us that they needed to do to be successful in a particular program? So I think that's a really, that's a big area of experimentation, I think, um, for a lot of digital companies, particularly remote companies who are kind of playing around with the delivery mode. I think Teresa's making a really good point. And the key thing about what she's saying is that uh, the order, like just think about your 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 uh, health history flow, right? And we all have, are old enough to have seen it in the doctor's office with the clipboard. And now that happens through a series of screens that you fill out after, you know, before or after login, depending on how it's set up. And if you don't capture the right information clinically, you won't deliver safe care. So there's that. But then there's the order in which you ask the questions. And a really great example is actually social drivers of health information. We have this equity moment. We've been in it for a few years now. Uh, but if you ask a health insurance company, they've been they've been ordered for 20 years to ask about people's race. And their response rate is about 15 to 20% because people don't trust health insurance companies. And so there's these spaces where you might really want the information so that you can deliver your personalized care, but the person for their own reason doesn't give it to you. But th that's all in the kind of that, that is like that collecting the health history is kind of in the administrative setup, right? And if you don't have complete information, and there's also plenty of research about patients withholding information from doctors in traditional medicine, it happens all the time, then your care is, your care as a professional is going to be modified accordingly. I think all the healthcare professionals who are on this call with me would agree with that. But that's really different than having your care team 
provide X, one version of the protocol to one group of people and a different version of the protocol to somebody else to see what happens. That's actually a delivery. And that's, you know, I, it, it, my ethics are that th that shouldn't happen without the patient knowing that they could get protocol A versus protocol B. And we have to always ask ourselves, you know, the, the classic RCT being a drug versus a placebo. Everyone can kind of wrap their heads around that, but then you just translate drug and placebo into protocol A and protocol B. And you have to really think about when is that difference in those protocols uh, potentially going to deprive somebody of helpful care or provide them with care that's potentially harmful because it's experimental, air quotes, um, and they didn't know that they were subject to an experiment. Yeah, I think just on these points, if, if I could, uh, really, Teresa and uh, Lucia make really nice points. And I think we're talking about the initial experience that you have with healthcare, or healthcare provider, or or healthcare company. And there are a couple of uh, things from a behavioral perspective that um, I think have been called out. One is building a clear mental model of what it is, right? I think, Teresa, you said, hey, tell me what this is, what I'm getting into. Um, and, and then the other things I think that Lucia got to are the importance of not only what questions you're asking them when you're thinking about getting a medical history or something like that, but also how the questions are asked. And so we've worked with um, companies like Belong Health, uh, which uh, service a dual eligible population. We're really thinking about onboarding, bringing them on to the, to, um, the healthcare plan, thinking about how can we build trust, right? We know that trust is a, is a difficult uh, uh, thing to have in the healthcare space generally. And then once you get to some of these, uh, the populations that are least well served by our healthcare, how do we deal with that, right? How do we address potential stigma that people might be feeling, especially around sensitive questions? Um, how do we uh, use maybe social norms to indicate that it's okay to have a particular, you know, mental health issue or something like that? And so I think um, one of the things we've worked with uh, with them on the clinical side is how do we build this welcome experience? How do we build this these questions in a way that's going to build a mental model of this healthcare experience as something that's that's going to be supportive and, and positive rather than something that's going to you know just be another stressor in their lives. So let's say I'm a product manager, right? And and my onboarding flow and, and you know, classic onboarding flows can have like dozens and dozens of questions. Um, when when do I reach out to my compliance team uh, for consent to, to apply a change to my onboarding process? Can, can you so, provide the audience with like a, a really practical handle? I'm not a philosophical I'm one. <laughs> being being the compliance team on the call, I loved your tee up to this, Thomas, because I think the answer is come early. Don't come after, oh, I did this thing, is it okay? Because then if something's wrong, you have to re-engineer the whole thing and you waste a lot of time. So if you come early, and this is what I try to foster in my own practice, I have a couple of books out about that. So Mobile Medicine, which came out two years ago, has a whole, chap whole three chapters on it. The new book came out Monday, Advanced Health Technology. You really have to collaborate. And the collaboration has to be, the compliance person has to understand where their client wants to go. And that could be you know, outside counsel or in-house staff. And the product team has to listen to why they can only go there by one of two routes instead of the third route they may have wanted to go to. And I've had that conversation. That particular route that the client presented, it's just not tenable. Uh, unless you want to get into RCT land, let's figure out what you're trying to evaluate what's the analysis you're trying to undertake and let's find an ethical and appropriately private also role to take that path. But it has to be an early dialogue and it has to be a two-way or three-way dialogue. It's very cross-functional when done properly. Sounds like sounds like Richard has a is nodding his head there. Yeah, I think it's a is spot on. And I think one of the things that we uh, often will do with uh, healthcare organizations that we're working with is uh, try to maybe get, and some of these things are hard to test, uh, honestly, and I think that's part of what this conversation is. But um, I think part of what we um, think about from a behavioral perspective is just generating hypotheses about what's going to be most effective, uh, whether it's in the onboarding, whether it's the, in the actual treatment, um, and then figuring out ways that we can creatively test those hypotheses. So maybe it's not right in some of these cases, 
it's maybe unethical or, or it's not going to be something you, you would even want to consider, right, with the actual uh, patients that you're treating. But maybe you go into a different platform and you say, actually, we have this hypothesis that building self-efficacy is something that's going to increase someone's likelihood to actually meet with a mental health care uh, clinician, how can we test that in a different context? So maybe we do sort of qualitative uh, research with a similar population sort of outside of this with full consent. Maybe we do uh, a randomized sort of uh, quantitative pretest where we can sort of, uh, again, with full consent, get a sense for, hey, if you have path A or path B, what would be uh, your reaction to this? And so getting some of those hypotheses tested in a way that's uh, maybe uh, from a regulatory and, and a privacy and an ethics perspective, uh, transparent and maybe outside of, uh, yeah, your direct patient population. And just to add one more thing, one of the real powers of d digital health is the ability to kind of look in real time. And so just assume you have, for, for example, say a thousand people in your getting your services and you can look at your data and look at the outcomes and you can see that 60, 666 of them have X outcome and 334 of them have Y outcome and X outcome is better than Y outcome. You should be doing more of X. You don't have to ask anyone. Your own data is telling you because outcomes are better. And it could be in a behavioral setting, you know, are there um, PHQ-9 scores? And we can talk about PHQ-9 and its genesis, which I read last week. I'm like, wow. Um, but right, is, are there, are, is their anxiety lower? Is their depression less severe? Wh whatever, they, is their blood pressure lower? Is their glucose lower? Can they breathe better? All the things we can measure. And that's a thing that's uh, that your own data is telling you that in fact, hospitals and and in-person clinics should be doing as well. This uh, physician has better outcomes than that physician. How do we get more of physician A out of physician B? And uh, that used to be called 20 years ago, performance measurement. And in fact, there have been you know, lots and lots of uh, measurement, HEDIS and payments to the physicians to get them to reduce the variation in their practice and replicate what the data says is working and stop doing what the data says is not working. So sometimes it's just a matter of looking at your data as opposed to actually setting up an experiment. Lucia, I think that's such a good point because I've been thinking about that a lot in the context of um, when we look at, you know, there, there's certain things clinically that you don't necessarily have a roadmap for because there are generally accepted practices for how you do something. And, and I think a lot about this in the context of um, we are often taking people off of their medications and off their insulin in our program because they are improving their A1C and they're doing much better with their diabetes. And there's a lot of variation clinically for how you could take someone off medication. There's no roadmap for that. There's no RCT for how, for how to do that. And there's different things that you can balance. And I think at the, at the heart of it, you want to keep them safe and you want to do it safely, period, like hard stop there. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, you take into account things like the cost of the medication. So you want to remove, if everything is equal and everything is equally safe, um, should you reduce the, the ones that are more costly to the member first versus the other ones holding all things equal? Um, but to your point, that's really around looking at your data and looking at the variation and saying, hey, which one of these pathways is actually working out better for the member and also uh, you know, is, is safe and, and having good outcomes. And so I think you can, that's not something I would necessarily want to create an A-B test around, but I think the data says a lot um, and it helps you look at the variation and say, hey, this is, this is the variation that we want to create as a standard of practice. And then anything we do should compare to that standard of practice from here on out. So maybe an important point to make here, what, what I'm what I'm not hearing, uh, I think, right? But please, please confirm, is that that the answer is in the data alone, or that that you know, people who are not used to working with data might think that there there could be causality in the data, right? But in the data, you will never find that causality. You you always need to tie the data back to what was the process that led to that data, right? What was the protocol that was followed that led to that specific data? Because just opening a dashboard, just, you know, going and digging into your data will never give you the right answers, correct? Correct. And I think there's different, 
you know, it's, it's very easy to look at data and make assumptions about various forms of clinical practice. And that can be really dangerous because you you need to look at, you know, if I want to look at um, uh, different PCPs and their panels and the outcomes of those panels, you can't just look at the data and say, hey, this PCP does a better job with their HEDIS outcomes than this one. You have to actually look at the phenotypes in their panels. Um, do they take care of more complex patients? Oh, this particular PCP has expertise in a very complex area. And so they may be attracting a different type of panel than this panel. So you have to take into account all those different pieces of data when, to get the full picture. I think that's really important. I, well, I, so, I, yeah. I was just gonna, I'm gonna add to that. And I was gonna try and extrapolate out from core healthcare, which Teresa and I have been talking about for a fair amount, like HEDIS takes you way back. Um, but when you think about where we are now with digital health, I think that this conversation is so important because it it has to be uh, when you come to digital health and you've never been in healthcare before, you come with some standard practices from, for example, e-commerce or ad tech, whatever you would call that business. And you can have to relearn some things. And there's some really stark examples from the um, ad tech world that probably uh, were gross violations of medical ethics if they had occurred in a medical setting and they didn't. And I can tick off a few off the top of my head, but I'll just start with Cambridge Analytica. Remember, it was a social sciences data collection effort in the very beginning. And I personally don't think Cambridge University should ever have approved it without an IRB but they did and things have happened since then. And many, many of us are swept up in that. And they're very recent examples of this as well. Um, and so there's a, to get back to the why, right? Teresa is talking about, you've got to understand why an outcome, if you're just looking at your data is different in one context than in another context. And it could be, you know, the, the disease burden of the patients. It could be language. It could be the training background of the care providers, whoever. But also you have to understand why healthcare operates the way it does. And it's a completely legitimate exercise to go, how can I do something different, right? That's Omada, classic, took a protocol and broke it in pieces. One piece that can be delivered by computers and one piece that needs to be delivered by humans. And we've been copied many, many times. Um, and that was really innovative thinking, but that you have to understand why does it work the way it works, that protocol? What's bringing the health? What's making it safe? And then kind of, you have to dissect it really, take it apart and maybe put it back together so that you preserve the health promoting ethical parts of it as you go into your digitizing process. Yeah, and I think that's uh, one of the ways that sort of behavioral science really shines is understanding, creating and, and understanding hypotheses about maybe why a particular clinical approach is more effective or not. Um, because we know in behavioral science, we can ask someone why they do something, right? And uh, they'll come up with an answer. For example, if I were to ask you, hey, why are you saving for your retirement? You might say, hey, it's important for my family or, or I really want to be secure. Or if I ask someone who's not saving, why aren't you saving? They'll say, oh, well, you know, I've got near-term financial constraints I've got to deal with. But what people aren't saying is I was actually defaulted into my uh, company retirement plan, right? And so uh, when we think about, to this point, about understanding maybe why different clinical pathways would generate different results, um, taking this behavioral lens and saying, okay, well, I'm going to create some hypotheses about what might actually be happening, try to understand what does that pathway look like from, from the start all the way to whatever the, the treatment outcome is, analyze that pathway and identify some hypotheses about what might be happening from a behavioral lens, and then try to figure out, hey, how can we get at these? How can we try to test? Maybe maybe it's not an RCT, as we've said, uh, but maybe it's some, some other way of testing, either with data. Um, we have quantitative data. Sometimes we have qualitative data, but really going through that and evaluating all of the possible things that could be contributing to like perhaps a better clinical outcome, um, rather than maybe jumping to whatever the most, uh, you know, whatever we think at first glance, or asking someone, hey, why is this working? And, and people will come up with, an, with a reason, but it may not be the, the real reason. 
And it's so funny that Richard mentions the defaulting into retirement plans because I've been practicing law a long time and I remember when the rule used to be the other way around. And I remember the re the re the story of that research that led us to say it's okay to default people into contributions is truly phenomenal from a behavioral science and also behavioral economics standpoint. So if anyone wants weekend reading, go down that rabbit hole. It's really an astounding and great body of work for for the American worker. So let, let's let's uh, shift gears a little bit. So we've been talking about uh, digitizing standard uh, clinical practice, um, but what about those teams who want to innovate on clinical practice? Uh, not necessarily find new drugs, but uh, Richard already alluded to it. There's, there's this whole body around nudging, right? Uh, nudging, which can really help people take better decisions or be more engaged in their care. A very, very concrete example, which uh, I've read research on recently is, is with vaccinations. It's, it's, it's still relatively fresh in all of our brains to get a vaccine and then a booster shot. Well, the, the research was about uh, asking people very simply to write down the intended date at which they were going to get their booster shot. And only that, only asking people to write down a date uh, led to a four, per, four percentage point increase of people who who got who got that booster shot, which is obviously a, a huge uh, result at um, uh, for for big population. So um, let's say that I'm a team and I I want to I want to test out these very very small changes, right? These are very small nudges that that might not warrant a, a, an IRB or a, a three year study or you know a, a, a very you know carefully selected homogeneous population to set up and then analyze what how, how could people get started uh by testing out these kind of things even with the upfront realization that that they're actually doing this to drive better outcomes right yeah i mean i think the first thing is the conversation that has to include an appropriately qualified clinician and I'm, let me just break that down a little bit so if you are a company like twin who's working in the cardio metabolic space and your uh, relevant clinician i'm just going to pick on you for a minute tris is you know an orthopedist they don't have the right training to help you with this and so that's the first thing is make sure the clinician you're working with has the right background to help you with the problem at a at a design and product level that you're trying to solve. That's one. And then the first question is, I want to do this thing. What could be the bad consequences of this thing, right? That's the harm, right? Because that's what you're trying to do is avoid unexpected harm in, in, in one of two ways. And that's the, the essential dialogue. And then check your reasoning. That's where compliance comes in. We, we, we came up with this plan you know, from your view, looking at it ethically, and one thing that compliance professionals and lawyers are really good at is the outside in view. What would an outsider think of what we did if it became known? That's the conversation you should have very, very early on. Then it's a matter of designing it to meet all those don't hurt people, make sure it's clinically appropriate. So in your exam example, Thomas, that, you know, I, I can see it and hear in my head, I had no, no, I was not a party to it, but the dialogue about it, what happens if we see what happens when we ask people to write it down? It's like the vaccine version of a SMART goal, right, Richard? Yeah, and we know the science of SMART goals. You're not saying, let's ask some people to get two shots in a, 10 days and other people to get two shots in two months. That is clinical. And so there's a lot of gray area between those two examples, but it gives you some bookends to start planning from. And to Richard's point that, Let's see how smart goal science, which is very well established, could be applied to the problem of vaccine appointments. Little nudge. Let's see if it works. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll, I'll just jump in here. I think so. Um, yeah, Lucia's spot on. You want to involve the clinicians. You want to make sure that you check all the boxes. Absolutely. Um, and I think Thomas, you 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 highlighted sort of one of the fundamental problems of healthcare, and and one of the reasons that we study human decision making, which is uh, what we call the intention action gap. And this is basically the difference between hey, what we want to do and what we actually end up doing, right? So you may want to take a vaccination, uh, but there are tons of things going on in your life that prohibit you from doing that, right? You may have a, a kid that you have to pick up from school, or you have uh, some work thing that comes up, or any of a myriad of possibilities. And 
the example you cited says, hey, if we create a plan, what we call in behavioral science, create implementation intentions, we're going to increase the probability of following through and closing that intention action gap. And that's one of the things we're really, uh, we study and try to do. And from a healthcare clinical perspective, I think it's really important to think about the behaviors that people actually do rather than the behaviors that ideally we would want them to do, right? We, we know adherence is a challenge, right? And we know that you know, 50% of people after a year aren't even picking up their hypertension drugs, let alone taking them, right? So uh, when we think about the behavioral perspective, we want to understand not only, hey, in an ideal clinical world, what happens, but in the real world, what actually happens. And so that that's the first part. Second part I'll say is um, when we think about behavioral science, you, you mentioned nudging, which is a, a sort of a seminal part of behavioral science, and maybe one of the most notable parts because it's so well tested, right? And these nudges are so controlled and so well evaluated with randomized controlled trials. And so they can be easily quantified. I think that's one of the reasons they're so powerful. But when we think about behavioral science, uh, we think even, even more broadly than that. I think I would uh, we can open up to the possibility of infusing, you know, entire pathways with behavioral science, leveraging psychologies to improve patient outcomes. Um, it, it, certainly, we can do these these small tweaks, but we can even make larger, broad, broader product changes uh, using behavioral science. And that's one of the things that we work with a lot of our clients on: is how do we infuse this into the patient experience? How do we infuse this into the product? How do we infuse this into the the onboarding, the mental model that's being formed uh, so that we can deliver better clinical outcomes. So I think, oh, go ahead, Therese. No, go ahead. I was just going to um, kind of add on top of both of what you said. I think, you know, seeking out your clinical team or advisory board, your clinical advisory board, I think is an important first step. Anytime you're doing uh, any testing, make sure um, that that box is checked, checking whether or not you're going to do any harm. To your point, Richard, I, I love this idea of the intention action gap. I hadn't heard that before, but I love that because that's a lot of the testing that we try and do um, really around, you know, people intend to do well or to eat well and to, to follow a program, but in the moment, they may be struggling with whatever pressures of the moment, whether it's family pressure or they're at a great restaurant they love. And we think about ways in the product to actually test out, how do we help them in that moment? If you're going into a restaurant, can we, I, I love the cameo over here, um, so cute. Um, if you go into a restaurant, can we deliver something in the product to help you make good choices off that menu? Um, and, and we've been testing out things like that to help you in that moment, close that gap. Um, if you're about to eat a food and you're logging it, um, is there a way that we can help you make a better decision in the moment? You want to have this big burrito, but maybe we say, hey, try having half and that will actually, you, you can still eat it. You still are empowered to eat it, but this might help. Um, and then the last one is really, how do you mitigate something? So after the fact, if someone has, has had that full burrito, how do you help mitigate that and still allow them to have that autonomy and choice in their life? but help their outcomes. Um, and so we do things in the app like suggest, um, hey, for you, just going for a nice 20 minute walk actually might help you a lot. Um, and so how do you test that out in the right moment at the right time um, and address where that person is at? Kind of meeting, meeting the member where they're at, I think is a really critical piece. So I think that one of the themes that's kind of emerging here is for the, company trying to really do the right thing here. And there, let's be honest, there are companies not trying to do the right thing, but for the company trying to do the right thing, there, there's going to be differences between a behavioral nudge, eat a half of a burrito and, and other kinds of um, activity the company might drive um, about how often you test your glucose or did you take your med I mean, there's a whole long string and you have to really be thoughtful about, is it, um, physiological as an intervention that's going to cause a physiological thing to happen to the person. And what is that thing that's going to happen? Or is it an intervention that's like a, a behavioral reminder? Don't eat half a burrito. Obviously there's a scale, there's a scale problem there. Um, the second thing I think you're also hearing is the difference between infusing to Richard's point, behavioral science into your program writ large 
and testing whether it works on some people before you infuse it to other people, because that would be randomization. And that is expressly not allowed. So I just want to briefly remind the audience, you may not, your company may not personally be involved in federally funded research subject to the common rule. But if you screw up here, you can get debarred, which means you can't sell to federal programs. For example, you have to really think about the downstream effect of all of this. And so if you're a company that wants to grow and you have your sight lines on billing Medicare for your telehealth services or um, serving the um, Office of Personnel Management or your state Medicaid agency, they will ask you, is anyone on your staff debarred? And debarment happens when you conduct actual research unethically, you get debarred, among other things. So there actually are real penalties here besides just potentially harming the person. And you have to think about this very, very carefully as you pick how you're going to do it. And randomizing people without them knowing is 100% not okay. You can't say, I'm going to give these people these suggestions, or I'm going to randomly pick who gets these complicated clinical interventions and see what happens. That's a, a, an experiment we don't want to have. And it's tricky because I think the core of your, the a core problem we're trying to solve here is, okay, I want to test message A and I want to test message B. When am I randomizing? And I don't know that we have, there's no textbook you can open up and look at the answer. You have to figure it out for each proposition you have. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice segue, Lucia, into my next question. It might, might even be the last question that we can tackle today, unfortunately. So two weeks ago, we had a, a hangout with Sophia Guerra at Bessemer Venture Partners, uh, which talked about the, the different, you know, business outcomes, both, you know, performance, financial, clinical outcomes. And, and one of the topics that came out of there is that, uh, as a, for example, as a, as a venture-backed uh, tech-enabled services provider, if you if you fail to prove clinical superiority, you will you will not only not get any more VC money, but you will also fail to write those, um, you know, to get those contracts with with payers, with government, um, etc. And so. What I'd love to hear from each one of you is, let's say I'm one of those tech-enabled services providers, and after this call tomorrow, I can take one step, one concrete step that can help me start prove the clinical superiority of my care model versus standard care. What, what would you advise the audience that one very concrete step to be that they can take tomorrow? I mean, I think that uh, companies that are really serious about this need to have research teams. We have a research team at Omada. We have a director of research. We have behavioralists. We have a health economist. Uh, there's a great FTC guide just out last month that kind of describes what good health research, health product or health services research looks like. And there are many, of course, professional organizations one can go to to find these professionals who are by the way, they're very interested in working in in this in this little niche of the healthcare industry. But you've got to you got to have actual people who know the ethical principles, the methodological concepts. You've got to set it up in a way that when you present it to the traditional healthcare system, they recognize that it is in fact legitimate science. Oh, Lucia, I could not agree more, and I think that that is really key. I think. For any of these digital health companies to succeed, you've got to you you've got as as a former primary care provider, you've got to be legitimate in the eyes of the clinical community and the medical community, particularly in the U.S. And it's a pretty high bar. And in order to do that, you can you can find ways short term to make your program look attractive or to have great clinical outcomes. But at the end of the day, they want to see the clinical evidence to prove that 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 program is better than the other. So, um, you know, we do the same thing as Omada. We have a research team. We're working with a large institution and doing an RCT. Um, and so that's a really critical pathway. And that's for the long game. I think you can continue to, to uh, show your outcomes in other ways. Um, you can also use traditional quality metrics to start measuring your outcomes, um, HEDIS measures, Looking at um, claims, you know, claims outcomes. I think all of those things are really important for you to continue to follow because you've got to, you got to play in the sandbox with uh, with the medical community, and you have to do it in a way that's that's clinically legitimate. And so, I think that's one of the areas that a lot of companies have overlooked. Yeah, good. I totally agree with uh, Lucia and, and Therese. 
Um, the, the other thing I would add, and just from, a, uh, from my perspective, is one of the ways that I'm increasingly seeing, um, especially newer healthcare companies, differentiate themselves. Um, in some cases, they may not even like know the, the terms for what they're doing or how they're doing it, but they're thinking critically about the decision making, the actual behavior of the patients, and right, and and this is the core of behavioral science is really understanding how how are people going to react to my product, to the treatment that I'm offering, um, and how can I design an experience that is going to generate a better clinical outcome. And so um, if you if you have a research team, if you have behavioral scientists, if you have experts that are really designing patient-focused uh, outcomes, I think that's really going to help set you apart again. I think the behavioral science lens uh, is an extremely strong one and, and a way to approach that. Um, but I think that plus the evidence uh, that they mentioned, I, I think are two core differentiators. Okay, great. I think final then the bonus question. Just a couple of minutes left. If the, if there's one tool, could could be could be you know what kind of tools could be a framework as well, right? Frameworks are also tools. If there's one tool that has helped you in your role at doing this, what would you advise the audience to use? I'm gonna go last. Hear what everyone else has. What the clinicians have to say. I, I can't say I have one tool, to be honest, but um, I really, I, I had a lot of training in, in lean methodology, so I tend to think about things in the lean context, which is a pretty well-regarded framework in a lot of hospital institutions and healthcare settings. Um, it has its imperfections, but I think that is one that I go back to a lot when I'm thinking about ways to test and do um, incremental improvements and continuous improvements. Uh, at Irrational Labs, we have the three B's framework of behavioral change, which is first identify the key behavior that you want to change, then amplify the benefits, and then reduce the barriers. This is a, a framework or a, or a tool that we use when we're thinking about how do we infuse uh, behavioral science into, into a, a product. I would say my go-to methodology is uh, Montessori level Venn diagrams. What two things are like each other and why are they like each other versus when things look the same, but they really, really aren't. Um, and this is kind of like a core thing that lawyers do. They look at new facts, apply them to old rules and figure out when the analogies fit and when they don't fit. And then that's how they come up with their conclusions. So my whiteboards, you can see them in the back, are often covered with multiple Venn diagrams where I um, as I'm trying to sort out the things that clients have asked me. Well, and I think that's a perfect circle, Lucia, to my very first slide where, you know, some things in Amazon um, would, would fit nicely into the Venn diagram of uh, clinical practice and some would fall out of your Venn diagram, right? So, right. And it depends on the question you're asking. Is it price exactly. transparency? Is it messaging? Is it wait times for appointments? I don't know. Cool. Uh, we're at the end of a very, very interesting hour. Um, I think Rick will have a big challenge condensing this to just a couple of insights because I heard a lot of stuff that can be reused and applied. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and, and, and for spreading your insights and learnings on this. And to the audience, uh, happy to see you next time for another CareOps webinar. So much for having us. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Bye. Thanks, everyone.